Greetings and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I am Bill Grant, Chair of the Club's Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum and the Chair for this program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker for today's program. Deborah Davis, a PhD, Master's of Public Health, is a scientist, professor, speaker, and acclaimed author, and recently testified before a United States Senate Committee panel about the dangers of cell phone use. Her first book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, was a National Book Award finalist. Another book was The Secret History of the War on Cancer, published in 2007. This book showed how the leaders of industry acted to downplay research on prevention and keep research on environmental causes from gaining widespread circulation or benefiting the general public, and how the suppression of knowledge continues today. Of course, we can look at examples like uh, BP's uh, oil rupture in the Gulf of Mexico. Thus, she is no stranger to controversy in exposing government cover-up of the adverse health effects of industrial produ production. She is a visiting professor at Georgetown University. She lives with her husband in Washington, D.C. and Jackson, Wyoming. And her book will be for sale in the lobby. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today and I'm really thrilled to see so many people turn out for this very important topic. I have to tell you that when I first heard the possibility that there could be something wrong with cell phones, I didn't believe it and I didn't want to believe it because at the time I had three cell phones myself. And they're very convenient gadgets, and I still own phones, and I still use them. But I've learned in the course of the research that I did for this book that cell phones are not safe in the way that we use them now. And by the time I finish this talk, I think you'll understand why I've reached that conclusion. The truth about cell phone radiation is that it is a microwave radiation. That's the truth. Industry has, in fact, tried to hide in information about its dangers, and you need to know th how to protect your family. There are disconnects when it comes to this issue. There are things that we know in science that the public doesn't know. One of them is that cell phones are, in fact, small microwave radios that have never, never been tested for safety. Another is that microwave radiation can be damaging even at low levels, but we assume it is harmless. In fact, the very word microwave sounds like a soft, cuddly thing. I'm going to discuss with you today three reasons why we know it's not harmless, based on models of the brain uh, that have been developed of children and adults, experimental evidence showing DNA and other damage, and human studies that indicate some harm. Yet another disconnect which really shocked me when I found this out, is that other modern nations, far more sophisticated and more experienced than we in using cell phones, have advised protecting your family for almost a decade. And, but companies are issuing fine print warnings that most of us never see. I hope that by the time you've read my book, heard this talk, you'll take your cell phones out of your pockets, off your nightstands, and recognize that distance is your friend and you do not want to hold a microwave radio next to your brain or body. Industry has fostered confusion in response to reports that cell phones cause brain cancer and other things. Industry has mounted a very impressive campaign to confuse people, to create uncertainty, to hold uncertainty up like a cross to the vampire. We're uncertain, they say, and because we're uncertain, we should do nothing but continue current policies. And as a result of this industry-fostered confusion, we get the unprecedented use of this largely untested technology. Now let's talk a little bit about what the electromagnetic spectrum is. It everything on this spectrum moves at the speed of light. It's uh, invisible except for what we can see in that very narrow portion here, visible light in the middle there. Electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from the things that give you electricity to power the equipment we're using here today, all the way up to gamma rays and X-rays that are ionizing. And because they're ionizing, they can break the bonds, the ionic bonds that hold chemicals together, and cause severe damage. Now, I believed, when I first looked into this issue, that it was physically impossible 
for non-ionizing radiation, seen here at radio waves and microwaves and cell phones and radar, that it was physically impossible for that type of radiation to have any damaging effect unless it caused heat. And that belief is shared by a lot of physicists, even today. I'm going to explain to you why it's wrong. I learned as a scientist, having done research on tobacco, asbestos, and vital chloride, that oftentimes beliefs of science can be just like religion. They're held very strongly, but they're not necessarily well established with facts. And I like to say that we should trust in God, but all others have to provide data. Now, the first radar range was developed in 1947. It was, in fact, based on radar. And I tell the story in my book of how it was discovered. Um, in fact, a fellow noticed that a chocolate bar he had in his pocket melted when he stood close to the radar. That's how the idea came about for using radar to cook food. The first radar range in 1947 was a huge thing. It had its own water cooler. It weighed 700 pounds because of all the insulation that was needed to protect people from being exposed to the radar. It cost about as much as two cars, and it used about 1.9 megahertz at 1,600 watts of power. It, as you might imagine, wasn't a very popular device. It was renamed the microwave oven because radar ranges didn't appeal to a lot of people. Radar ranges, my, na renamed microwaves, suddenly became popular about the same time as women started to try to get a little more freedom out of the kitchen. And it did revolutionize the ability to cook things faster. But one of the interesting things about the microwave technology, and some of you may remember the old ovens, was that they created cold and hot spots and so your food wouldn't be cooking very evenly. You know, if you took a piece of steak and you put it in, in a frying pan and half the steak's in the pan and half the steak's out of the pan, on average the steak is cooked. But in fact, half of it is not cooked at all. Well, microwave ovens <clears throat> didn't evenly cook things, so the solution to that was to use a turntable to rotate the food to avoid the hot spots. Keep in mind, a cell phone is a small microwave radio. We don't get to rotate our heads. Today's microwave ovens operate at 1.9 to 2.4 megahertz on 1,000 watts of power. And they can boil water in two minutes. Cell phones are microwave radios. They operate at the same wavelength as a microwave oven, but on less than a watt of power and can be used for hours a day for hours a day. That's not something most of us think about, that when we're holding this phone next to our brain, we are holding a microwave radio right next to our brain or on our bodies. Now the progress in cell phones has been remarkable. And here you see the progression in size from the first shoe phone all the way down to the tiny ones that we have today. You can see <clears throat> that the antennas used to be visible in the early phones. Here you can see the antennas. The antennas now are in the backs of phones, or in the case of the iPhone, on the sides of phones. What we know from studies done by a number of researchers around the world is that cell phone radiation, microwave radiation, reaches about twice as far into the smaller heads than to a larger head. And this is seen here. Here's the larger head. You can see it gets, this is actually adjusted for the half of the, of the head maybe about two inches into the head. This is the head of a very small person, perhaps a woman, perhaps an Asian person. This will give you a better illustration of how we set standards for cell phones. You see this much larger head, the one looks a little bit like the size of a bowling ball on your left. <clears throat> we call this fellow standard anthropomorphic man, Sam for short. Uh, Sam was the basis for which original standards were set. Sam was a uh, little over six feet tall, was in the top 10th percent of military recruits, had about an 11-pound head, and he didn't talk that much, actually. Originally, he spoke for about six minutes, and then maybe 30 minutes, and that was how the standards were set. For how long could Sam have a phone next to his brain without heating it up? 
That was the criterion. How long can you hold a microwave radio next to the brain without causing the brain to change in temperature? And that was based on a few animal studies that I detail in my book. The top series here shows you a 900 megahertz phone, and the bottom is the 1800 megahertz phone, which is more like the smartphones that we have today, some of which are 2.1, 2.4 megahertz as well. And these are studies done for the cell phone industry by a group of researchers in Austria showing the absorption into the brain of the head of a young child as compared to Sam. And you can see the same size phone is in both of these figures. You can see there's a much larger area involved. And you need to know this. Children are not just small adults. Their brains are, have more fluid. Their skulls are thinner. And as a consequence, they get more absorption of radio frequency radiation. Now, phone ownership has transformed our society radically. Right now, according to data provided by the cell phone industry, half of all 10-year-olds um, have cell phones. Half of all 10-year-olds have cell phones. And the average age of getting a cell phone is moving down rather rapidly. Now, I'm not going to tell you that nobody should use cell phones, but I am going to tell you that nobody should hold a microwave radio next to your brain for hours a day. Smaller and younger cell phone users are taking over the world. There are four billion users around the world today, and the average man, if, there, if we could find him, is five feet seven. Remember, Sam is six feet tall. There's about 2% of the US population um, for, that fits that height. Fewer than one in 10 users have heads the size of the standard man called Sam. Now, the models have, in fact, been developed that take into account the fact that all heads are not the same. And these models, again, were developed by researchers in Austria. You can see Sam on the left, and then you see the others. You'll note that most of these models, <clears throat> uh, there's only one female, and uh, they're working on a pregnant woman as well, because there's obvious reasons for concern that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Our DNA is at the core of all of our living cells. It's what makes us alive, and it's an exquisitely complex structure, a double helix shown here in this twist. Well, research has been done, independent research has been done, that shows that pulsed digital signals from cell phones can damage DNA. They don't work by affecting ionic bonds. They are non-ionizing, but they still can damage DNA. And I'm just going to show you some of the work done by a laboratory uh, group of 12 different labs throughout Europe with a $5 million study that in 2004, combining work in Finland and Vienna and France and uh, Spain, showing this result. If you expose cells to radio frequency radiation, seen down here, you can cause the DNA to start to unravel. That's what this is showing you. This is what happens if you expose those cells to a well-known cancer cause, namely gamma radiation. The impact on DNA from gamma radiation and from cell phone radiation is similar, and if anything, the impact from the pulsed digital signal looks worse. This is stunning work, and it's been replicated in many places now. This is not the work of one scientist in one lab, but the work of many scientists collaborating around the world. And I'm going to talk to you about some interesting controversies about it in a moment. Now, on the right here, you see a nice intact cell of the brain, and on the left, you see the damage that can occur to the blood-brain barrier after exposure to a pulsed digital signal. Now, why is that a problem? Your brain needs protection. All of our brains need protection. We wear bike helmets, we wear ski helmets. We recognize the brain needs protection. The body has a barrier that protects the brain to keep toxic agents from getting into the brain. Brilliant research was done recently to confirm findings that were first developed in 1970, showing that you can weaken the blood-brain barrier. 
that's what this is, this big hole here, by pulsed radio frequency signals. That's a very big concern. That would mean that if you work in a workplace with toxic chemicals and you have exposure to electromagnetic fields from cell phone radiation, you're getting a double hit because not only are you getting a weakened blood-brain barrier, but then anything in your body can be more easily absorbed into your brain. Now, human studies of cell phones are the most difficult. First of all, they're expensive. They cost a lot. The last study done on cell phones and human health in the United States of America was published in 2002. There is no major program of research underway now on this subject in human health. The last epidemiologic study on brain cancer and cell phones was published in 2002, and that meant it studied people who were using cell phones perhaps 10 years earlier. How many of you had a cell phone in 1992? Just a few. Few people have used cell phones heavily for a single decade, and in a moment you'll understand why that's so important. Cancer is not the only outcome of interest. I'm not going to talk to you just about why I think cell phones cause brain cancer. Cell phones can cause a number of serious diseases. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, hearing loss, infertility, and lowered sperm count. The evidence when it comes to human studies is not solid. But as a public health expert, I think we've got to take a step back from debating whether we have enough proof of sick or dead people. We've got to take a lesson from what we learned about tobacco and asbestos and vinyl chloride, where the absence of definitive human evidence was used to excuse policies that continue to expose people to things that turned out to be very dangerous for them. Is there anyone in this room who doubts we should have acted sooner to control tobacco or asbestos? As I documented in my other books, the debate about tobacco and asbestos was a manufactured debate in large part. There are still legitimate scientific questions about the ways in which tobacco causes cancer or asbestos causes cancer. And there's still important research to be done. But the failure to have definitive human evidence was used as an excuse to continue policies that failed. Think about this. When the atom bombs fell to end the war with Japan in 1945, there was no increase in brain tumors in survivors until 40 years later. 40 years later. Now that was one massive exposure. If it requires a 40-year latency between exposure and the development of brain cancer, we're going to be in big trouble as a society if we wait for the body count to mount. In fact, most studies of humans do not find that cell phones increase brain cancer until at least 10 years of heavy use. Most studies, all right? Most studies have defined a user of a cell phone as a person who makes one call a week for six months. Let's talk about the interphone results. There was no overall increased brain tumor risk again with the user as someone making one call a week for six months. The risk was increased for heaviest users after a decade using a phone for 15 hours a month. And they studied cell phone users between 1990 and 1994 that developed tumors between 2000 and 2004. Right? No current studies on this subject. The average US use now is 14 hours a month. What if, what if the results of Interphone turn out to be applicable to our US population? We would face a catastrophe. And if this were to happen on a global scale, we would never be able to deal with it. We already do not have enough oncologists in this country, particularly in non-urban areas. And throughout the world, we lack oncologists. That's not the solution to the cancer problem right now. Now let's talk about the limits of these human studies of cell phones. Today, most adults have cell phones eight times more than had cell phones in 1990. And studies of cell phone use in the 1990s, which is what the Interphone study is, 
really cannot tell us anything about the current technologies and the use by younger persons because patterns keep changing. What we do know is that heavier cell phone users have reduced sperm count, and we know this from studies in seven different countries. I'm just showing you here the results from the work at the Cleveland Clinic, where one in five of the men at the clinic used a cell phone for four hours a day. And they had half the sperm count of others. Now, research done at the National Research Center in Australia by John Aitken, a Cambridge University trained physician, has actually done animal modeling and they've exposed young adolescent animals to pulse digital signals from cell phones and have found that when they get to be adults, they have weaker, sicker sperm. What Agarwal did, and researchers in Turkey and Greece have done this as well, is to take samples from men, samples of sperm. Half of the sample he did nothing with, the other half he exposed to pulsed digital signals from cell phones. And he found that those sperm were sicker, could not swim as well. Now the distance a sperm has to swim is about equivalent to a human swimming from Los Angeles to Hawaii. We need a lot of sperm because it takes one healthy one to survive, to fertilize an egg. If sperm are being affected by cell phone radiation, this is a big problem for all of us. Now, the FCC and the FDA and the American Cancer Society have recently all agreed on these kinds of precautions. They say you can reduce cell phone radiation by using an earpiece or a headset. You can avoid continually wearing a wireless earpiece. You can keep wireless devices away from your body. And they used to say you can use a low SAR phone to reduce exposure. Uh, that recommendation was just changed last week. Um, I think the reasons for that are a matter of speculation. They also advise you can consider texting rather than talking, but don't text when you're driving, and you can limit talk time. There's also one other thing you can do. It's very radical. You could turn your phones off. Very few of us need to be on emergency call 24-7. And although I know it's very common, not many of us really need to check our email when we're in the supermarket checkout line. We've become accustomed, habituated, perhaps addicted, to the convenience of the technology. And it's very convenient, and I'm a big user myself. But we have to start to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Is it worth the risks that we're incurring for ourselves and our families? The backstory now. Science has been used as a form of public relations when it comes to the cell phone story. Doubt creation has become its own industry. And in my book, Disconnect, I document how patterns of creating doubt have been perfected and extended. Here's another disconnect. In 1972, Alan Frey showed that pulsed microwaves affected cell membranes and could weaken the blood-brain barrier. His research was discontinued the next year, and I tell the story of what happened to him in my book. Henry Lai and Vijay Singh demonstrated that cell phone-like radiation damaged brain DNA. Actually, the first results were reported in 1994. They, their universities, and their work was attacked, and I detail this in my book. The industry mounted a major public relations campaign. First, they asked the journal editor to, quote, unaccept the paper. Then they wrote to the university and NIH seeking to have funding revoked. Now, for a scientist, this is equivalent to accusing them of a massive fraud, the kinds of things you go to jail for. And finally, they wrote, quote, I think we have sufficiently war-gamed war -gamed the lie Singh issue, assuming that the scientific advisory group and CTIA have done their homework. This is from a memo from Motorola executive Norman Sandler to Michael Kiels of Burson Marsteller, dated December 13th, 1994, that can be found on my website and on the websites of many others working in this area, including Microwave News, this has done an outstanding job of documenting the sorry history of industry efforts to discredit scientists. 
Industry then, when they failed to do this, hired another scientist, Jerry Phillips, and they asked him to try to see if he could show what was wrong with the Lion Singh work. He had a contract for Motorola and the U.S. Department of Energy. Unfortunately, there was only one problem. He showed that Lion Singh were right. He actually replicated their work. Phillips, Lai, and Singh no longer work in this field at all. And my book, Disconnect, tells the story of what happened to them. The University of Vienna researchers that I showed you before produced results showing the damaging effects of DNA, replicating work that many others had shown over the years. I tell the story of how they didn't believe their results in the beginning, and when they showed this impact, because they had a lot of money, they went out and brought, bought brand new equipment, because they thought, this can't be true. It's impossible. The physics say you can't have biological impacts of non-ionizing radiation without heat. Well, being scientists, they repeated their results. Then something very interesting happened. They were charged with fraud. And the headlines that their work was discredited went around the world very, very quickly, as though they were being encouraged. And in fact, we know they were. This past month, an Austrian court and a university committee have ruled that the accusations of fraud about this DNA work were in fact a fraud. And there's been no headlines and no media report that in fact DNA can be damaged by cell phone radiation. But the headlines that accuse them of fraud are still around and people in the scientific community still believe the work wasn't valid but I'm telling you here today that it is and was valid. Now, what do you do? How do you protect yourself? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that really surprised me, and frankly, uh, being American, I confess to a certain belief that our country is the best and the greatest in everything. And I think we can be, but in this issue, we are not. France and Finland and Israel <clears throat> and the European Environment Agency all advise reducing direct microwave radiation to the brain. They all say, use a speakerphone, use earpieces. And this advice is on government websites, and you can find it on our website at environmentalhealthtrust.org. The actual advice translated in some cases or in the original language as well. Limit children's use of phones next to the brain. In France, it's actually illegal now to market and advertise phones, especially for young children. These billboards I'm showing you here were from Lyon, Le Portable Avant Deux Ans, say no. Portable phone before 12 years of age is no. That was a billboard at the city of Lyon in 2008. They were concerned about cell phones and health of their children then. The French government, in January of 2009, passed laws banning advertising to children, banning the design of phones to be used by those under six, requiring that every phone be sold with a handset. Now, more recently, the recognition of this problem has moved into the government officially as well. And I want to share with you a very welcome development from the cancer panel that advised President George W. Bush. That panel concluded that the environmental burden of cancer has been grossly underestimated, a position that I have documented in my book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, but also specifically calls for long-term monitoring and quantification of electromagnetic energy related to cell phones and wireless technologies, recognizing the incredible exposure we have now. The last national survey of exposure to radio frequency radiation in the United States of America was conducted in 1980. 1980, three decades ago. The National Academy of Sciences in January of 2008 issued a report on data gaps, and they said we need research on the exposure to internal antennas. Those antennas are now all inside the phone. We need to study people going forward, meaning prospective, and going back, meaning retrospective. 
and we need laboratory studies on neural networks and better models of human exposure. The response to this report? Nothing so far, except that a study that was first proposed in 1999 by the National Toxicology Program to evaluate experimentally the impact of radiofrequency radiation in animals, that study just started this year. All right? Almost 20 years since it was first proposed. Now, what's the response to the United States? I, this is an ad from the internet telling you that your five-year-olds will really have a lot of fun using a phone. But there's something really wrong with this picture, and my colleague, Dr. Lisa Ridgway, a, a dear friend and pediatrician from Jackson Hole, is going to speak to you about that in just a moment. I think we have to take a lesson and look at what's happening here and recognize that truth is stranger than fiction. Thank You for Smoking was a very popular movie and a well-written book based on the difficulties of a man promoting smoking in the population. Uh, his job was to sell tobacco. It's a hard job. He was a sympathetic character, and he met for support uh, once a week, support from his other colleagues who had difficult jobs. Uh, they were selling alcohol and guns. And they called themselves the Mod Squad, Mod for Merchants of Death. At the end of the movie, there's a new recruit to this effort of selling difficult products. It's a group of guys in suits, and the scene uh, evolves. This is the last scene in the movie. Uh, off camera, there's a voice saying, well, is it true? And they say, well, we don't know, or we need, we're not sure. Blah, 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 blah. And then the answer is, gentlemen, practice these words in front of the mirror. Although we are constantly exploring the subject, currently there is no direct evidence that links cell phone usage to brain cancer. Well, I'd like to ask you to think with me about what direct evidence really means. I mean, that studies on rat DNA brain, is that direct evidence? The studies on DNA damage, is that direct evidence? The studies on the blood-brain barrier, is that direct evidence? Studies on the production of chemical markers that we know in other studies always mean cancer risk, is that direct evidence? Or are we really, at this stage of our civilization, are we really going to say to people, you wait until we can tell you a mechanism, and you wait until we have enough sick or dead people before we act to prevent a massive epidemic? Are we really going to tell this profitable global industry that they should continue to market in the United States to our children and my grandchildren a device that other countries have warned should not be held next to the brain? I would hope that we've reached a different point. And frankly, I know our colleagues at the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association are meeting down the street. I don't think they're talking about this issue now, but I think they need to. Because their response to health concerns in 1993, when they were first raised, was to say there were 10,000 studies showing that cell phones are safe. Well, in my book, I document there were not 10,000 studies. In fact, today there are fewer than 1,000 studies, according to a government, German government resource. Calling for research becomes an excuse not to change policy. Saying we don't know the mechanism, if we didn't know the mechanism, we don't know the mechanism now by which tobacco causes cancer exactly. But there's no one who debates that it does. Calling for research on mechanisms is part of the program. We need to wait. We need more research. Well, you know, I'm a scientist. I've set up Environmental Health Trust because I want to reach the public, and we're supporting basic research. But the absence of definitive research on this should not become an excuse for continuing to expose people to a very important hazard. Now I want to go to those fine print warnings. You see here the cover of my book, and you see this iPhone 4 pamphlet. How many of you have read the warnings that come with your phones? In this room, I think a few people, all right? Most people don't know that your phones come with warnings, okay? Just to give you an idea of the size of the print, and this is real size, here's what the fine print warning on the iPhone 4 says. When on a call using the built-in audio receiver, 
Hold iPhone with the dock connector pointed down toward your so shoulder to increase separation from the antenna. When using iPhone near your body for voice calls or for wireless data transmission over a cellular network, keep iPhone at least 15 millimeters, that's 5 eighths of an inch, away from the body, and only use carrying cases that do not have metal parts and that maintain at least a 5 eighths inch separation between the iPhone and the body. Then it tells you that if you keep your iPhone 4 in your pocket, quote, may exceed the FCC exposure guidelines for body-worn operation. We don't read these things. We don't know about these things. In fact, San Francisco is to be commended. Despite industry opposition, they passed a right-to-know bill about cell phone radiation. And right now, I'm pleased to tell you that Andrea Boland in Maine who was the first woman member of the Commonwealth Club here in San Francisco years ago, and the citizens of Burlingame, and the citizens of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, are all getting the right to know more about cell phone radiation. There were hearings in Maine in March, and Dane Snowden was asked why cell phones come with fine print warnings. And he said, we'll get back to you. Well, Mr. Snowden, it's six months later. I think it's time for you to tell us the answer. We have developed a campaign for safer cell phones. It's under development. You can join us online. At Twitter, we are safer phones. We tell you, use an earpiece or a speakerphone. Don't keep the phone on and on the body. Text message rather than talk. The Secretary of Transportation recently proposed warning labels on cell phones because of his concern about distracted driving deaths and accidents. I think cell phones need warning labels too, for distracted driving, certainly, but also because they do emit electromagnetic radiation, exposure to which may cause brain cancer. The new BlackBerry torch <clears throat> comes with the warning that pregnant women should avoid exposing their abdomen to the phone, and that teenagers under the age of 20 should avoid exposing their lower abdomen. Why are there fine print warnings on these devices if there's not a reason for concern on the part of companies? The world, in fact, is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. And I'm very proud to introduce my colleague, Lisa Ridgway, who's going to talk to you about some concerns we have, but I want to share this image with you first. This was done by a wonderful young photographer, Toss Robinson, and it shows a concern that he has, that we have as well. Young women are keeping cell phones in their bras. I've been called by physicians who have written case reports warning that this has caused breast cancer in young women who are healthy, who have no family history of the disease, who are under the age of 40, and who have kept their phones in their bras. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Let's be aware that this is a bad idea. In fact, this violates what the cell phone industry is telling you in the fine print warnings. Nowhere does it say it's safe to put a phone in this proximity to your body. Dr. Ridgway has worked as a pediatrician in Jackson Hole for many years, and now she's going to talk to you about some other cl clinical case reports that she has. A clinical case, a single case, does not an epidemic make. But a single case should be a wake-up call. And I had a patient recently who is now 25, got married when she was 19, got shipped back east with her husband when he was... Um, in the army, then he was deposed and he was gone. She was on the East Coast by herself for long stretches of time without knowing anybody. So her friend became her cell phone and she talked on her cell phone every day for hours to her parents, to her high school friends, anybody who would listen. While she was in the military, she developed a small lump on the side of her face and couldn't get into the military um, medical services. And it just gradually got bigger. She talked to her mom, who's a nurse, who said, oh, it's a benign thing. We'll 
get it taken care of when you get home. When she came home after two years, she had almost a golf ball sized tumor, and she was reassured by her family doctor and the ENT doctor that this was benign, it was a Wharton's tumor, not to worry, we'll take it out. And it surprised everyone when it was cancer. Now, just because one thing happens and another thing happens, we know the first does not cause the second, but it should at least make us aware. And here's your parotid gland. It's right on the side of your face, right where you put your cell phone. Keep clicking. Just click, keep clicking the arrow down. Okay. Parotid tumor glands have tripled in Israel since 2003. And now one in five of those tumors are happening in people under the age of 20. Now, we don't keep records of this in America, so we don't know. And there's where your cell phone sits, right on top of your parotid gland. The Israeli Dental Association has put out a warning. One in every five rare malignant tumors of the cheek occurs in someone under the age of 20. Young people should limit direct exposure of the head to microwave radiation from cell phones. No question. So now I think, what can we as pediatricians, parents and grandparents do? I think we don't want to be retroactive. We don't want to wait till final studies are in. There's a study going on right now called Moby Kids, and it's 13 countries, and they, for some reason, did not include the United States in that list of countries. And it may find out definitive research in 10, 15 years from now, and it's going to be an ongoing study. But I think we now don't want to be retroactive and wait for the final results. I think parents, grandparents, pediatricians are proactive. We catch the child before she falls. We have our child wear seat belts. We feed them organic food, which is much more expensive, just on the off chance that there may be a risk of the pesticides in the food. So I would urge all of you to follow the advice of Dr. Davis and you know, let's be proactive with our younger generation. Thank you.